so important that we just that we remember who we are, who you are. Where our place is in this world and how we can help those who need who need that help. Whether it's through prayer, whether it's through caring for them. So we give everything to you this day, Father. Good morning, Caribou Hill Temple, and hello to those of you who are watching online. I know not everybody watches it Sunday morning. Some people watch it throughout the week, and just really grateful that you are kind of following along with us. Hopefully, you've been a part of the Red Letter Challenge as we've been kind of working through it, and I hope that you've been enjoying the conversation that we've been having these last few weeks, whether it's just by reading the teachings from Zach or whether 
it's been in your small group or whether it's been through the sermons. And as you know, we've kind of just, he's kind of summarized the, all of the teachings of Jesus, which of course you can't, even in the summary, you can't look at everything that Jesus says about every one of those topics. And he kind of pulled out five topics that we've been kind of working through together. And so we started with the idea of being, forgiving, serving. This week is giving, and next week will be going. So this topic of giving, it's often, um, you know, that, that topic that most preachers hate preaching about and most modern listening listeners hate listening to. It has um, in it all of this potential for a misunderstanding and confusion and thinking that the church is just trying to to gouge you and not wanting to come across that way and just all of those things and yet money is one of the things that Jesus spoke about all the time he spoke about money more than he spoke about love and grace and forgiveness and even in salvation in fact the only other topic that even comes close or that he speaks about more is the kingdom of God <laughs> And of course, so we're, we're not going to be able to, in the next 25 minutes, touch on everything that Jesus says about money. We can't even do that in the Bible study, let alone in, you know, this little sermon that we're working through. We're going to start with this text from Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 34. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. The but if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own and so the the first thing we're just going to look at is that what we see in this text or what we see generally in the teaching of jesus when it comes to this idea of money and giving is that um, he wants us to have the right heart. See, Jesus' number one goal um, for your life is that you will realign your heart with your creation mandate. And we see that it's simply summarized in the Great Commandment, right? Which is the, the summary of all of the law and the prophets. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And then the second part of it is love your neighbor as yourself. And so... Really, Jesus, everything he wants is for him to say, can your heart align to this? Can you really love God with your absolute everything? And can you look to your neighbor with this kind of desire to serve them even more than you take care of yourself? In the midst of the, the text that we read here in Matthew chapter 6, which is part of the, the Sermon on the Mount, um, 
Jesus gives this analogy about the eye being the lamp for the body, and if it's dark, then the, the, the eye can't see. And we, we, we know this, right? Our eyes take in the light, and with the light, we're able to distinguish what's what. And when um, that doesn't work, then we're not able to see. We, we go blind, right? And why does he kind of throw this analogy in the midst of this? And one of the reasons is that when we have an out-of-balance love or a dependence on money, that it's not always plain to us. We don't always see it, right? Some sins, some things that happen in our lives that we know are wrong, um, it's very clean, clear, right? Like, we're like, oh, I stole that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's wrong. Oh, you're not my wife, right? You're committing adultery. Um, but we don't always know when money has a stronghold in our life or when we're being greedy and what's greedy except for um, a desire or a deep need for possessions, for money, for stuff. And part of the problem is the water that we swim in, right? Um, if you're living in Vancouver or the greater Vancouver area, you realize very quickly that there's just never enough money. It's a very expensive place to live, right? And it's very hard to be able to, to, to get a house or an apartment or a condo and not be um, taking a mortgage that has you way past what you're supposed to be investing in as far as your average income. And in the midst of that, you'll be around people at your kid's schoolyard or other people you interact with, and you'll always realize that there's somebody who has a bigger house or has more money or has more things than you do. And so you might, in that, think, well, I'm not really that wealthy because there's so many other people who are living such a better um, life when it comes to possessions, money, all of that stuff. And yet, do you know that if you make anything around 45000 or above a year, that you are considered to be top of the 4% earners in the, in the world. The top 4%. And if you make something like $55,000, you are in the top 1% of earners in the world. You are the 1%. Not only that, but in kind of the West, in North America and Canada, we're living in one of the greatest standards in all of world history. We live better than kings and queens and all the other royals used to. Just in the fact that, you know, we have running water and some of us own land and just all of these things, right? These are things that, that in history just weren't true. But our heart can betray us in our quest for more and this, this need for this kind of greed that we don't actually see. But also, money can be this thing that is about security, right? Jesus says, um, don't be anxious about what you need. Don't be anxious about the food. Don't be anxious about clothes. Don't be anxious about all of those things, right? And really, so what he's saying is that when you're anxious and you think that um, money and stuff is going to comfort you, then what is happening is actually your heart isn't aligned with that original creation mandate, this deep connection, intimacy with a God that you can trust, with a God who is good, with a God who is going to supply your needs, with a God who is going to feed you. That, that there is in us this need for us to control and that money becomes the tool with which we use to be able to do that. And Jesus said, no, you're supposed to um, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek that above everything else. Make that your heart's desire. And then everything else will be given to you. See, here's, there's, here's the, the idea, here's the big concept that if we can get the heart right and then our pro priorities will switch and God will supply our actual needs and then we'll be able to see money for what God wants us to use it for. <laughs> In our text today, he says, Jesus says, where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. He says you can't serve both God and money, or mammon. Mammon is the Semitic word for both money and for possessions, right? He says you can't really serve God and serve this thing, this stuff, this, this desire to have more, this desire to find your comfort in the stuff that you possess. 
And at the same time, money can be this great indicator of where your heart actually is, right? If you were to open up your bank statement right now, open up your phone, go to your bank statement, and you were to, to, to look through all of the things that you've spent over the last four or five months and where your money has gone, it would give you a, a sense of where your treasure is. What do you treasure the most, right? Um, where do you look to, to find your comfort when you're anxious, right? Um, or... How about this? Is there anything that you would not give away, that you would hold tight in your hand and say, no, no, no I'm not going to give that away, God. It's too, it's too precious. It's too valuable. It's too good if God asked you to. <laughs> Is there anything that you would hold and say, no, no, that's too important. God, I can't, I can't give that away. Not only do we see in this text that we need to make sure we have our heart right, but we need to make sure that we have the right goals. You probably um, have heard the saying many, many times. I think there was a commercial for it for some video game system or something like that where it said um, that he who dies with the most toys win or he who dies with the most possessions wins. And that actually is ver very much kind of our world philosophy, our world thinking, right? Even though we might not say toys because it seems like they're so arbitrary or unimportant. <laughs> but this idea of um, accumulating wealth, accumulating stuff, and that being what helps us to see people who are prestigious, to think highly of people who have everything um, and then abundance and more. <laughs> I remember when we were in our house in Langley, it was a much, much bigger house. It was newer. And what we found was that in our master bedroom, there was this huge walk-in closet. Not only that, we had storage in the front of our bed too. And there was like a place for all of these clothes. When we moved here to Burnaby, it's an older house, and we moved instead of a big walk-in closet with two sides, one for each of us, we moved into a place with only two kind of small closets, and so we had to arrange them, put on an extra row so that we could get some of our stuff in, but of course it wouldn't all fit, and so you had to get rid of it, and you start to realize that all of the clothes that we have, we don't actually need, we don't actually wear, and um, we recently moved from the top floor of our house where we had two closets, one for me, one for Deborah, and into a place where we only have one closet. And so again, it's like, oh man, what do we have to get rid of? And if I'm kind of perfectly honest with you, that when I look at my closet and I look at all of the shirts, all of the pants that I have there, I, I don't wear most of them. So even that, there's just a sense of like, I own this and I don't actually need it. Some of it I've never worn, <laughs> probably because it was a bad choice to buy it in the first place. In Luke 12, 13 to 21, Jesus is telling this parable of a man, and he has this incredible harvest, and it's so big that he's filled up his, his silos, his kind of, his buildings for holding the grain, and he's kind of looking at them, and he realizes he has more and more and more, and so he says to himself, you know what, I'm going to tear down those old buildings, I'm going to build one that's much bigger that can store this incredible harvest, and then I'm just going to relax, right? Actually, the picture is almost like I'm just going to retire. Freedom 55, right? I'm just going to live with all of the comfort and all of the pleasures that I can because I have accumulated this incredible wealth. And then Jesus says that God looks at that man and he says, you are a fool. This very night I'm going to take your life and all of that wealth that you've acquired for yourself, you won't get to experience. You won't get the retirement. It becomes completely meaningless, right? What good is it for you to have this storage of stuff and never get to, to use it or to use the things that it might bring to you? No, there's something bigger. There's something more important, and it's foolish to invest in the stuff that's in this world, right? It says, don't lay up for yourself treasures here on earth that can either be stolen or destroyed or eventually they just become useless. Instead, I want you to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. What does it mean to lay up treasures in heaven? 
And as I've thought about this, as I've read about it, as, as I've studied it, I think ultimately there's only two things. The, the first is like a deep love and service to God, that as we learn to, to worship, as we learn to prioritize our life, as we learn to, to, like the Lord's Prayer says, to hollow the name of God, to say you are holy, you are worthy, and to, to change your heart, that is one of the few things that will be eternal, this, this praise, this worship, this being intimate with him, and that when we learn to, to, to serve him and to be obedient and to do the things that he's called us to do, that we are ultimately storing up treasures in heaven. Now, I don't understand fully what that's going to look like or fully how we're going to experience it, but there is kind of this sense that Jesus says that when you are serving me or you are serving other people, right, that you are, are storing up for yourself treasures in heaven. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, it's the, the final ju judgment, and Jesus is calling all peoples to himself, and he's separating people um, based on this one criteria. And what's the criteria? The criteria is that um, he says, whatever you have done, whether it was giving out food or going to see uh, me in prison or clothing me when I was naked, that whatever you did, he says, to one of the least of these my brothers or least of these my sisters, you did it to me. It's so interesting as we've been going through this COVID time and all of the crazy experiences and people um, saying, you know, we're heading into the last time and there's all this argument about whether we should take vaccines or whether that's aligning ourselves and the mark of the beast, all this stuff. You know what, like, I think that if we're honest that the end times are coming, then our response should be, how are we serving other people? What are we doing to the least of these, um, our brothers and sisters? Because that is how God is going to judge us, not whether we fell to the systems of this world or whether we took the mark of the beast. That is not as important as how we loved and served other people. And so if the church really believes that the second coming of Jesus is imminent, then our desire should be to empty everything we have and make sure we are giving it to others and being generous in our love for other people. The second thing that is storing in heaven is this deep longing for the lost to be saved. For those who don't know the love of Jesus to experience the love of Jesus. For those who are walking around in ignorance to be revealed the truth that God loves them and that God wants a relationship with them. What good is it if you are able to give your children all of the wealth of this world that they could inherit from you when you leave, but for them to miss a relationship with Jesus Christ? What good is it for your children to be given opportunities to be good at sports and to never be a part of the community of believers and in that way for them to walk away from the church saying that wasn't the thing that most influenced me because my parents didn't put me there? What good is it if they become a soccer star and go to hell? It has no value. It's not eternal. It's not a heavenly thing. See, people are the things that are going to last. That's what we want to store up in heaven. Right? Loving people. As Salvation Army, I think this, there's always this tension for us of being a people who are very generous towards other and other people are very generous towards us. The heart of our mission is always what? Salvation. Not to be known as the best charity in North America. That's garbage. It's junk. But to be known as a people who are so in love with God that we are compelled to go and to share what we have with other people. One of the warnings that Jesus gives to the religious leaders of his time, but to everybody else as well, is that it's possible for us to follow the letter of the law and to give our money, to give our tithes, and to give our offerings, and to not love God or to not have a motive that says that I want to serve other people. That we want people to say, oh, you are so great. You are so kind. Thank you so much for what you've given to me. Thank you for taking care of me. Or um, you really are just a great organization. He says that if that is what 
you are doing it for, you will receive your reward in that and you will miss the reward of heaven. Right? Be careful that you do stuff so that people will see you in the praise of people. Instead, do it so that God might see it. See the heart of it. See the intention and that he might see it as beautiful. And it might be one of those things that are stored in heaven for you. The, the last thing that we, we want to see in this text is that um, there's, there's a right use for our wealth. See, money is a tool, and in and of itself, it's neither evil nor is it good. But it's how it affects us that reveals its power. It's how it, it motivates it, how, us, how it captures our heart, how we feel that it's what gives us our security and safety. First Timothy 6.10, there's this famous verse, right? It says what? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. <laughs> when you have such a deep longing for money, a deep longing for what it can give you, either power, control, influence, safety, that when that becomes the thing that you do, then you'll do all kinds of things because that's what you want. That's your heart desire. He says, money itself isn't wrong, but that, that love. Or Hebrews 13, 5 says it like this. He says, um, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. See, Jesus is saying that if you have this, this longing, this longing for money to be your security, you'll never be really secure. But if your security, if your heart is in God, you have this promise that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. Somebody might come and steal your stuff, somebody might come and take what you value, or it might get burnt up in a fire, or the stock market might crash, or inflation might go through the roof, right? And if that's the thing that you're hoping for, then with all of those things, your emotion, your anxiety, your everything will go. But if you are centered in Christ, he will always be there. And so ultimately, we are called to be a very generous people. See, um, Zach in the study, you're going to see this over and over again. He says that after we have read the words of Jesus, it is impossible for there to be a stingy Christian. Jesus lived incredibly simply when he was on this earth. He didn't own anything. He didn't own property. He didn't have money. He trusted on, other, on God to provide through other people. And what he did have, he constantly gave it away. He constantly gave it away. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but when Jesus goes and he calls Peter and James and John and Andrew into ministry with him, he does so after they've just filled two boats with fishes. For them, that would have been the biggest catch they have ever seen in their lives. That would have been an opportunity for incredible wealth but they looked past the wealth of that moment and looked to the beauty of Jesus and they left all of that behind and gave their lives to follow him to never ever be rich and wealthy men. It would have been thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars there. The opportunity for them to live in comfort, maybe not even have to work for a few years. See, to them, Jesus was so much greater than all of the wealth that this world had to offer. And so they followed him. They watched how he was generous with his time, with his gifts, with the things that were given to him. And after being with Jesus for three years, watching as he poured out his life for those who were actually um, his enemies, for those who were mocking him, that he forgave them, just with this incredible generous spirit that he that he fed that he washed the feet of those who were going to betray him knowing it that just this incredible life of always pouring himself always giving always sacrificing always being generous that when the early church began to be formed this is how they were described we see it in acts 4 32 37 it says this all the believers were one in heart and mind no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. 
With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that, they were, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and laid them at the feet of the apostles. And it was distributed to everybody who had a need. Man, what an incredible picture we see of the early church. In fact, we're told Joseph, who was a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, that he went and he sold a field that he owned and he brought the money and he put at the apostles' feet as just an example of somebody who was willing to give everything so that everybody might be taken care of. Man, what a picture of a generous community. That they didn't hold on to anything, that they didn't see their property, that they had worked hard to be able to get, or that they're, they're, they had inherited, that they didn't see it as something that they were supposed to hold on to. They saw it as something that they were supposed to give and pour out so that the whole community could be taken care of. Here's the thing. When we learn to be a generous people as Christians, then we encourage other people to be generous. I remember that um, we were living at a church and, sorry, we weren't living at a church, we were part of a church and we were living at our house and we were introduced to this girl who had chosen to become a Christian and in so doing wanted to align her life. She had been pregnant, she was about to go and have her baby aborted and she felt the Spirit of God talk to her and she decided, nope, I'm not going to do that. And in so doing, the people who were letting her live with her um, kicked her out. So essentially she was homeless. She had nowhere to live and her family wasn't willing to take her unless she um, aborted the child. And she just felt like God said to her, no, I, want, I love you and I want to take care of you and your child. And so we met her. She was virtually a stranger to us at the time. And we knew that there was a couple in our church. Their children had just moved out. They had a little apartment that they, they owned. It was separate from the rest of their building. And so we went to them and said, would you be willing to use that space that you have for this person to be able to live and to be safe and to have their baby? And um, the fact that they didn't know her, the fact that she was homeless, all of these things, they just felt incredible fear around that. And yet these, these were the best tithers in our church. They were very lovely, very generous people. And um, so what ended up happening was we ended up saying, okay, well, I guess she'll come and live with us. And so she lived with us, and not only her, but one of her friends came and lived with us for a while. And this couple kind of watched from the side, and they were incredible. They would, every so often, they would drop off um, bread, and they would drop off toilet paper and the things that, you know, you just run out of when you have extra people living at your house. And they just watched as... Um, God moved in the lives of the people that we were with and that we were just able to, to kind of minister to. And this, this girl eventually got out on her own, all that type of stuff. But there was this opportunity for this other girl who was living in a shelter, who was homeless, who you know, was just starting to get a consistent job. And they decided that what once was scary to them was no longer scary, that the, the fear that they had around a stranger, somebody who was homeless, coming and using their house and all that stuff, that it was worth it. And they allowed this woman to come and to move in and to use their home, to use their property and all that type of stuff, right? Because they saw that there, there's a cost to being generous, but at the same time, there is a reward. And that reward is greater than anything that could have been made by renting out or selling that place or anything like that. That it's a heavenly reward. So often when we talk about money in the church, we, we go to tithing, right? Which is that percentage that you're supposed to give of your money to the church in order for the church to function, pay for staff, pay for the building, pay for all that stuff. And, you know, usually it centers around that, that tithe, that, that biblical concept of 10%, and Zach's going to teach well on that for you this week through your study. But um, Jesus, he never wanted to limit us to something that is so easy and attainable as 10%. See, he loves us too much. He cares too much about our heart being in the right place, that our heart being right and our love for God and our love for other people. 
He cares too much that our actions and our practice are, are right. He, he cares too much about you to say, oh, just as long as you give your 10%, everything else is okay. See, he's called us to live a generous and a sacrificial life. For some people, 10% will be like giving up everything. Jesus tells the story about the widow who threw in less than a penny into the, into the offering. And that as she did that, Jesus looked at her and said, she's given more than the people who had given thousands and thousands of dollars at the same time. See, when you can give out of your wealth 10%, it doesn't mean anything. But when it's a sacrifice, when all you have is those few dollars, and you're like, okay, God, I give it to you, trusting that you'll take care of it. See, God, God sees that, and he says, that's a hard. 10% for some of you is nothing. You spend more than that on vacations in a year. More than that on a car. God loves you too much to let you sit in that place. He calls you to be generous, to lay up for yourself something that is eternal, that is heavenly reward. Let's pray. God, you are a generous God. You gave all, Jesus. Jesus, you paid it all. You sacrificed yourself for us. And we are motivated by your love for us to love you and to love others. To want to be a generous people because you are a generous God. Brother, sister, let me serve let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too.
want to pray out over this people. We are a people together. We want to pray first for unity. We want to pray that you would increase our love for you. We want to pray that we could see you high and lifted up, glorious. We want to pray for a greater sense of gratitude for all you've poured into us in grace, in forgiveness, in love that just stimulates a natural flow out in service and love to others. And so I want to pray for my friends here. Some of us may never have taken that first step into joining in service together. And I just pray that you would give them the confidence and the insight to know how to step in and partner as part of the church together and bring their gifts to see them multiplied by the many other people they join. And for those who have been burned out by doing service out of duty and it's become um, kind of a slug. I just want to pray for a renewal of love. I want to pray first that you would bathe those people with your love, that they would know how precious and loved they are, and that you would refresh a new call, maybe not even to the same kind of service. Maybe you're calling them to something different, but show them how you would have them pour out the love that you place them on behalf of other people. This is your work we are your people. Jesus, use us to bring glory, your kingdom, in our neighborhood. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. I invite you to stand and sing with us. As we wait upon the Lord.
Yeah, isn't that an absolute beautiful truth that as we pour ourselves out for God, he's the one who fills us with the spirit. He's the one who helps us and equips us and trains us and gives us the strength. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, I was thinking as you guys were watching that photo, it would be really hard to recreate it now because uh, they're all taller than me. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, we serve, a, we serve a good God. And so we want to always end by giving him praise and glory and honor. So to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and glory and honor and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen.